Good evening, everyone. I'm Deborah Cunningham from Primary Source, and I want to welcome you warmly to our webinar this evening. It's on the injustice system, African Americans and the law, from Jim Crow to today. I'm so delighted that this evening we will be joined by Dr. David Harris from the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute at Harvard Law School. Many of you, I think, are part of our webinar series, and we're delighted to have you back with us for the second webinar in our series. Uh, the series as a whole has three webinars, as you probably know. We heard from Marcia Chatelaine from Georgetown University, and her webinar is now available on recording. Tonight, we have Dr. Harris, and on March 14th, we will be hearing more about Black Lives Matter with John Stauffer and Lauren Mascareñas of the Southern Poverty Law Center, the Teaching Tolerance Program there. We have an important announcement about that final webinar in the series. I just learned today that Lauren has a conflict with the evening timing of the webinar, which means that instead of doing it at 7 p.m., we are going to do that webinar at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. So that would be 3 p.m. Central Time. And it will go until 5.15. So please make a note of that. And if you need to make arrangements in advance to try to make it to that earlier time, we're really sorry about the inconvenience. But it was inevitable. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce David Harris. David is the executive director of the Houston Institute for Race and Justice at the Harvard Law School. Just one of them, actually, not schools. Uh, <laughs> and he's been there for many years working on a huge variety of civil rights issues, everything from police brutality and racial profiling to redistricting to domestic violence. He's worked on voting rights, fair housing, community development, all the things that we hear about and read about in the news all the time, and he's part of the community that tackles them with different kinds of initiatives. Right now, one of the Houston Institute's big initiatives is the Houston Marshall Plan for Community Justice, which is a project designed to actually listen to the voices and expertise of people who live in underdeveloped communities in urban areas and to take seriously their recommendations for how to solve problems. Before he came to the Houston Institute, David was the founding executive director of the Fair Housing Center of Greater Boston, which generated analyses of housing discrimination patterns in Greater Boston and helped to lead the way toward more fair housing and greater regional equity. He's also worked at HUD and at the US Commission on Civil Rights and he's currently the chair of the Massachusetts Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. David is a sociologist by training. He currently is a, a teacher at Cambridge College, a lecturer at Harvard Law School, and in general, a very engaged, involved citizen working to advance human rights in the Boston area and beyond. So we're so thrilled to have you with us, David, tonight. Um, over to you now for our discussion of the injustice system. Thank you. Well, thank you, Deb, and uh, uh, good evening, everyone. It's, it's really a, a, a treat and a pleasure for me to be with you. I'm a huge fan of Primary Source and have been for many years. Um, I think the work that it does is, is fabulous, and I'm really glad to be a part of it. Um, I, I do want to take a moment, I, I will say, in driving over tonight, I was listening to the news, and, and I, I just want us to, to take a moment to uh, give our thoughts and, and hopes and, and prayers, if we will, to, to those in Florida, your, your colleagues uh, uh, and, uh, and the students. I'm just uh, actually deeply moved and troubled by it. So we'll take just a moment, if we could. Um, so I, I, I say, as I say, I'm, I'm somewhat shaken by that, but I am, I'm, all, I'm also a little bit <laughs> bashful about following Marsha, whose presentation was really stellar and uh, set the bar very high. Um, 
I, I hope I can approach uh, uh, her contribution. Uh, a few preliminaries before I start. As, as Deb said, I am employed at Harvard Law School, but I am not a lawyer, uh, and I do have a doctorate in sociology, uh, but I'm not an academic. As Deb said, I've spent over 40 years doing civil rights and justice work, and think of myself as an advocate for change. Um, as such, you know, what I'm going to say is it won't be an annotated historical survey of the law and legal decisions, although we'll touch on some of those, um, and neither will be an academic exercise. And I won't marshal large quantities of data and graphs and charts. Uh, uh, rather, you know, what I hope to do this evening is share some observations about law and society that come from my own particular experience and perspective developed over my career. Uh, what I used to jokingly describe to my students as uh, the world according to David Harris. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, I'll cover a lot of ground you already know. Uh, perhaps some of it you know better than I, and uh, will definitely overlap a bit with the previous and subsequent presentations in this series. You know, I hope to provide or provoke some fresh perspective and even insight that might be helpful to you. Uh, you know, I want to begin with this reflection uh, by Langston Hughes, which, which actually captures a, a great deal of my perspective on, on American society, and I think uh, is a sobering one, and I, I join him uh, in, in, in this uh, aspiration for working toward uh, what America could be. Um, as Doug said, I, I work for the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice, which was founded in 2005 by Charles Ogletree to honor the legacy and continue the work of one of the 20th century's preeminent attorneys. I'm sure many of you know uh, who he was, uh, but he's rightly known as the father of, uh, uh, of, uh, the civil, of civil rights law and uh, both his brilliant legal strategy leading up to the decision in Brown versus Board of Education and for uh, its legal strategy, as well as training an incredible uh, range of uh, uh, civil rights attorneys uh, who actually uh, presided over the case uh, after his tragic death in 1950. Um, uh, so, uh, and this, this he saw as, as, his, as his mandate, and the mandate that he set for lawyers was uh, to actually work for the advancement of the group and the people, and it's that legacy uh, that we seek to uh, uh, extend at the Houston Institute. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the lawyers he trained, I, I would really commend to you uh, Kenneth Mack's uh, uh, marvelous book, Representing the Race, which talks about uh, the creation and, op and, and, and conduct of the first lawyers of the movement. Uh, so it, now, again, uh, although Houston's legacy includes a, a great deal of, uh, uh, of, of other, uh, other aspects to use, social science and uh, community activism and, and advocacy to craft uh, Brown versus Board of Education, but he did leave us with this uh, telling uh, uh, comment, uh, and, and it's one that we, we take to heart at the Institute. Uh, and although it's rather harsh, it conveys a belief uh, that the law uh, can and must be used as an instrument for social change, and that's the position I take. And it's actually anchored, that, that notion is anchored in something that we hear about a lot, about the idea that, that our Constitution and, you know, must be interpreted according to evolving standards of decency. Uh, recent events have certainly proven to us that, that, that evolution is not linear as we've gone from a president uh, whose standards I think were quite high to one whose standards I think are quite low. Uh, but, uh, I, I, and I'll say that uh, by inserting politics into the discussion, however um, uh, I hope uh, gently I do it, you know, I want to remind us that the law doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, it's not a pure or absolute, and indeed from a sociological perspective, uh, it's a social construction. I think it can be used to protect members of society from wrongdoing, even from ourselves, um, but it, it can also be used as an instrument of social control and oppression. And of course, it can be both things uh, at once or for different groups, and uh, this seems to be the case as I understand it in the United States. Uh, I present you also as a father of a 17-year-old, a, a young man I'm trying to help understand uh, with me the complexity of social organization, uh, the relationship between ideology and fact, between ideals and practice, between agency and oppression, between voice and erasure, between power and truth, and most especially, I think, between law and justice. 
On this point, I want him to understand uh, that the law is not about justice. Indeed, in the United States and elsewhere, the law can and often does operate in the service of injustice. Um, so, so all of these things arise when we consider the history of race, especially for blacks uh, in, in the United States. Uh, as an aside, you know, I've been uh, commenting lately that it's often the case when we talk about race, we're talking, we use it as a, a stand-in for blacks, as if whites don't have race. But uh, I think it's important for us to kind of understand uh, that, that uh, it, it does, in fact, uh, cover the entire society. Um, but I'd say that the history of our country that we'll talk about tonight is really actually built on exclusion. And, and the pathway toward justice, I think, goes through or is paved by uh, increasing inclusion. And it's, it's the challenge we face as a society. Um, so, and, and then I, I would also argue that the law obviously is understood as more than uh, court decisions or statutes or legislative actions. But it includes uh, the range of regulatory activities and uh, uh, other formal and informal policies uh, under color of law to implement and enforce the system of control. Uh, moreover, I think the, the legal system has to be understood in terms of the violations it permits as well as those it punishes. So it has a formal and an informal, a seen and an unseen aspect. And, uh, Last uh, session, Marsha mentioned sundown towns, and they represent an example of a kind of extra legal practice. And you know, it's uh, I, I think it's probably for me, it's it's always jarring to realize that signs like this peppered the landscape uh, for for many many years in the last century. And uh, the, the the sad truth is that they took various forms of expression, uh, and and in point of fact, they set a tone in the country. Uh, that 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 actually limited the need for them. It, it was it, it became in a way an unwritten law of the land that black people understood that there were certain places they needed to leave before sundown, uh, whether there was a sign up or not. Uh, so there are also examples of of, of these kinds of, of racial restrictions that were written into the covenants for for property. Uh, you know, and it's interesting. We we think of them as having been outlawed in the 1950s and 60s, but several years ago uh, we actually found a, a, a racial covenant still in a deed that was publicized in a in a local newspaper and. Uh, it had it had slipped through the cracks, and, and and that very fact was an indication of kind of how unalert we are to the continuing vestiges. So, and I have to say, I have to cop to one thing here. I think I'm going to go a little bit be before Jim Crow uh, uh, quickly because I think a lot of the uh, uh, the residue of our past uh, carry you know starts uh, well before Jim Crow. So when I started to, to think about uh, what I was going to say today, I asked a colleague of mine to see if she could find me a graphic that could depict the first, uh, the first uh, African setting soil on, on the uh, North American continent. <clears throat> and my colleague, uh, uh, Kelly Garvin, is, is, is quite, uh, uh, quite a genius and, and, and very literal. And she went and she found uh, something by Skip Gates in the root that identified Juan Garrido uh, as the, the first African uh, to set foot on North American soil in, in Florida as a member of Ponce de Leon's uh, search for the fountain of youth. And, uh, and I said, well, that's not exactly what I meant, but I, I, that's an important thing. And, and, let's, let's, and, it, and it reminded me of another uh, African, one who I thought was the first African, who was somebody named Esteban, uh, who himself had been a slave. And uh, in 1527, uh, accompanied uh, a, a, an expedition that was a Spanish expedition to colonize Florida. Uh, now, that expedition, which was led by a Spaniard named Cabeza de Vaca, uh, uh, did, failed miserably, and uh, several hundred men died, and uh, only four survived. And those four men, uh, over a period of years, worked their way from Florida uh, out to uh, the southwest. And they did this largely as a result of Esteban's incredible linguistic skills that allowed him to communicate uh, and uh, 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 kind of guide them uh, west. Now, in the official histories, Esteban is removed. He's completely erased. The story is written by Devaca, and uh, you find no traces of him. 
And this to me is a really critical and important piece of history, of our history, and it has to do with the erasure uh, that, that we experience. I'm, I'm behind on the slides here. Uh, that story is, is told quite compellingly and, and, and in kind of very readable form in this book by uh, uh, Robert Goodwin called Crossing the Continent. Um, so, in fact, what I meant when I asked my colleague was I was speaking in the kind of, uh, according to the biases we all have, and I was obviously thinking of the great northern colonies, the, 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 uh, those settled by the Dutch and the English, and that we come to think of as the original 13 colonies. And, uh, and, uh, and as we know, uh, really the first uh, slave, first Africans to arrive, arrived uh, in Virginia in 1619. Uh, but as we also know at the time, we didn't really have a notion of slavery, and those Africans uh, were basically treated as indentured. They were treated very much like uh, uh, white, their white counterparts who were indentured, and you know, they were granted their freedom after a fixed number of years of servitude. Uh, this is critical for our understanding of the history because it's not the only time blacks and poor whites were united at the bottom of the economic ladder. Uh, but in both instances, the forces came to play that would divide them by race. And in, in, the, in, in the early days of, of the colonies, what happened was there was a, a slowdown in the migration of whites, and the burgeoning agricultural economy really had a growing demand for labor. And over the, over the next, you know, the last uh, decades uh, of the 17th century and early decades of the 18th century, we started to see this movement towards slavery. Uh, the first most interesting, important case is 1640 case of John Punch, who was a runaway slave who ran away with a couple of other white indentures, was a runaway servant who ran away with a couple of other white indentures, and was, they were all apprehended. Punch was sentenced to life. Uh, well, the, the whites were given extended indenture, but not permanent indenture. And here we see the beginning of race relations in our country with similarly, similarly situated black and white, blacks and whites treated differently by the legal system, by the emerging legal system. The following year, uh, uh, 1641, both Mass Massachusetts became the, Massachusetts, mind you, became the first colony to legalize slavery, and it was followed by Connecticut. So, over the next century, uh, other colonies obviously legalized the status, and the slave trade grew into a formal uh, uh, trade. And a series of practices known as slave codes emerged uh, that were designed to protect uh, ownership of this property. These codes varied, as you know, from state to state, but they were designed to accomplish two basic fundamental goals. Uh, one, to identify specific constraints that could be applied to uh, enslaved uh, blacks uh, and provide uh, the authority and eventually mechanisms for enforcement at the behest of owners. The code set limits on a wide range of behavior beyond escape into such things as uh, prohibitions against learning to read and write. And their goal, the goal of these codes was to ex exercise total control over the enslaved. Uh, uh, there was obviously a, a, a lot of very detailed information covering the years leading up to and following the revolution, but a couple of other notes on the early period. Uh, in 1705, Virginia's code forbade slaves from assaulting whites and acquitted whites for killing slaves in the process of punishment. This duality uh, 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 can, comes to represent the, the, the real uh, uh, how should I say, uh, the core of the American legal system as far as I'm concerned. And because the following year, uh, New York ruled that uh, blacks, slaves or blacks who killed whites were subject to the death penalty. And that, that continues to be the case to this very day, that the greatest predictor of whether or not uh, uh, a defendant will be charged with and or prosecuted for the death penalty is the race of victim, which is to say, uh, it is much more likely, regardless of the race of the defendant, that a white victim will prompt the death penalty. And this fact uh, has been uh, kind of really enshrined in our system and has come, you know, I, I kind of uh, have come in recent years to think of it as a, a legal system and our history that's based on the notion that white lives matter, that the law was designed and practices were designed to protect the lives of whites and deny the humanity of blacks. 
So obviously the two go hand in hand, and as we'll see, there are features of oppression later enshrined in the Constitution, but as early as 1704, we saw the birth of American law as a mechanism of oppression. And this found its real uh, expression in the slave, slave patrols that were designed to uh, uh, enforce the slave codes. And these, these folks came to be known as patty rollers or PADD or PATT rollers. And it was the first known instance was in 1704 and the practice spread. Uh, these patrols were loosely regulated or monitored, effectively operating under color of law to apprehend runaways, uh, often abusing in their authority by stopping any black found off the plantation. So you know, I would suggest that centuries later, now today, this kind of uh, practice is, is embodied in what we know as stop and frisk policing. You know, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but it has many of the same remarks. Uh, so, so this one's out of place, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I, I'm not going to do a survey of, uh, of, of, of the law and the Constitution, but I do think it's worth noting that uh, the Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3 of the Constitution, which is known as the Fugitive Slave Clause, reads quite simply as you see here. Uh, and uh, that law, that, uh, that, that uh, element, of, that article of the Constitution was then, oh, I missed something here, all right, yeah. something's out of order, was, was then uh, codified uh, in the Fugitive Slave Act passed in uh, 1793 using virtually the same language but creating a statute. And there are a couple of things to observe about that. First thing I will observe is, is, is the language of the law, which is uh, uh, to uh, describe slaves as uh, those who are uh, in service to labor, uh, or in service of, of labor. Uh, and uh, the second is uh, that we find here uh, the, the, this process of codification, uh, the, the, the Constitution serves uh, in a way as a blueprint uh, for the laws, but the statutes themselves are the, the, are the, are the kind of the, the actual edifice that's created. Um, so you know, see, I think I'm afraid my slides are a little bit out of order. But again, uh, I think uh, one of the questions that comes up it has to do with our sacred documents. And, and I go back to, to uh, the Constitution as kind of uh, uh, the, the second in a series of documents that flows from uh, the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence and this wonderful phrase and this, be and this beautiful, <laughs> beautifully written, uh, we the people. Uh, which, uh, you know, for many years, I think, has been characterized, you know, as some, as some today might characterize as something of fake news to uh, those who uh, were oppressed under the, uh, s the system of laws that was uh, implemented by the Constitution. And again, I go back to the Langston Hughes uh, phrase that America was never America to me. One other note before pass, before moving on is, uh, you know, I, this this is a book that's come out recently that you know I haven't had a chance to read yet, but I I, I have kind of read some reviews and and heard the author interviewed and and, and it tells the story uh, of of George and Martha Washington, and uh, the, the the gist of the story is that. Uh, uh, the Washingtons, when they moved to Pennsylvania, were, came under the authority of Pennsylvania law, which said that any slave uh, who uh, uh, came to accompany somebody in, Massachusetts, in, in Pennsylvania would be free after six months uh, in the state. And what the Washingtons did was they would return their slaves uh, to Mount Vernon uh, just before the expiration of that time, uh, stay there for a few days, and then bring them back in order to avoid that. And, uh, you know, apparently, uh, they were not particularly bad owners in, in, in the way that we think of some of the more violent uh, um, uh, plantation owners, but they were determined. And this uh, runaway on a judge, uh, uh, they spent many, many years trying to, uh, to recapture and using the full extent of the law to do so. Um, so now, what is true for uh, uh, the, of the, the slave patrols uh, uh, that were uh, engendered by the uh, uh, Fugitive Slaves Act, which, which was designed to allow the recovery of property that had run away. And 
the fact is that the, it was a rather weak mechanism. It, it didn't really work that well. And uh, on the other hand, it did give rise uh, to the Underground Railroad, uh, which uh, was a thorn in the side of the southern planters uh, for, for, for many, many years, uh, so much so that uh, by 1850, uh, in the Great Compromise of 1850, which gave uh, allowed California to become a free state in exchange for a, a stronger Fugitive Slave Act that upped the ante on, on, on uh, kind of apprehending slaves and, and set fines for uh, uh, local officials who, who, who refused to comply with that law and, uh, again, is somewhat reminiscent of the situation we have now uh, with sanctuary cities and ICE and uh, the, the, the federal government requiring local jurisdictions to uh, apprehend uh, uh, people they, they identify as uh, appropriate for apprehension. Uh, one note is that one of the most uh, famous uh, examples of, of this was the rendition of Anthony Burns in, uh, here in Massachusetts, uh, uh, which generated uh, a, a huge uh, a riot and, and an attempt to free him from authorities, which ultimately failed, but really sent a, a message uh, that, uh, that Northern, Northerners were not going to be cooperative. Uh, and, and then, of course, we have the Dred Scott decision. Um, uh, again, one of the most notorious but really, really important decisions of the Supreme Court ever. Uh, in, in this decision, uh, Judge Taney, this decision, which is often kind of characterized as incoherent and, and, and really uh, lacking in any kind of intellectual or legal, legal rigor, did, however, contain incredible language that set the tone for uh, for uh, uh, society's uh, ideas about blacks and and with the critical comment uh, that uh, that blacks have no have no rights which the white man was bound to respect uh, and uh, you know this this uh, this this logic this this thinking uh, would be permanently enshrined 40 years later in Plessy v Ferguson with this idea that uh, blacks were inferior and unfit to associate with white race. This didn't just spring out of uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. This comes out of Tony's writing in Dred Scott. Um, so at the time, it, it, we did a, a, a large, uh, a, a huge uh, conference in 2007 commemorating the 150th anniversary of the Dred Scott decision. I should add as an aside, as part of that conference, which uh, included uh, a reenactment of the case before a, uh, a panel of federal judges chaired by a Chief Justice, um, by Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer. Uh, at this conference, uh, none other than primary source uh, did a, a unit uh, for teachers that was incredibly well attended and I think uh, uh, a, a huge success and was in fact my first uh, kind of uh, association with primary source. Uh, among the other things that we did in that, as part of that conference was uh, to, to think about uh, the, the, the state of citizenship, since, since Dred Scott really effectively denied citizenship, the state of citizenship 150 years hence. And, and that review found that in some many ways we, we had made some progress, but not a lot in some of the regular markers of citizenship like voting and what have you. Uh, but we also kind of came to start to understand citizenship as something different. We came to understand citizenship as uh, a kind of two mutually enforcing processes, one of membership and one of participation. Uh, and as, you know, as Deb mentioned at the very beginning, part of our work centers around a notion of community justice uh, that is anchored in a, in a, in a recognition that uh, to expect people to participate in some kind of democratic society who have been excluded from membership is really uh, cynical, if not cruel, and that you know, one of our major goals and objectives is to find ways to increase participation, but also to increase voice and with the recognition of how they're, uh, how they're connected. So, you know, I assume that many of you uh, know a, a great deal about uh, uh, Reconstruction and, and, and uh, about the Civil War and Reconstruction, uh, but well, I'm behind on my slides. I got carried away. So anyway, that's our, that's our notion of uh, citizenship as membership and participation. And that's where it was. It's way out of order. Uh, so, uh, so, so following uh, uh, the, 
I'm sorry. Let me just see. Yes, so that's supposed to be the 13th Amendment. I'm sorry. Um, so I want to elaborate, talk a little bit about the 13th Amendment, which uh, Marcia also discussed in the last session, and kind of point out that, that the 13th Amendment effectively uh, uh, voided or, or, or corrected uh, the fugitive slave clause of the Constitution. And, and, and interestingly, it kept the same language of of, uh, of servitude and, uh, and, and, and included this provision about um, uh, being subjected to guaranteeing uh, the right except to those who were, uh, uh, have been convicted of a crime. And that loophole, if you could call it that, uh, is the basis of, of, of the, the notion of convict leasing that took hold uh, largely in, in the 20th century, but it began before that. And it was really a matter of collusion between uh, the modern day slave, slave uh, uh, catchers, patrollers, who were the, the kind of uh, 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 sheriffs and, and, and deputized, uh, readily deputized uh, 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 officials who uh, would round up blacks uh, and uh, taken before magistrates and judges who were also in collusion would sentence them to time that they would serve uh, and have to uh, uh, and, and provide free labor for, for industry, uh, it, it, including, I should say, um, some of the large uh, steel manufacturing companies that, that, that we know today. And one of the really kind of marvelous pieces of Blackman's book is in the aftermath, he talks about uh, some of the efforts that the, some of the modern day uh, corporations have made to kind of recognize and take uh, responsibility for what they had done, uh, bordering on reparations, if not quite yet. Uh, it also reminds me, I'm sure many of you know of this wonderful film uh, by Katrina Brown, uh, but it's Katrina Brown and her family's effort to grapple with uh, uh, her, her, her family's slave owning past and it, uh, it, it follows their conversations about doing it and, and follows them to Cuba or into the plantation that their family owned and it's really actually a, a remarkable uh, and, and, and really valuable uh, piece of work. Uh, as is uh, 13th, uh, which many of you I'm sure also know about. Um, and you know, kind of catapults us into the 21st century for a moment. Uh, but uh, one of the points is that uh, this idea that the, the 13th Amendment and, and this loophole uh, are, are, are a critical piece of understanding the system of mass incarceration uh, that, that we find uh, surrounding us uh, today. Um, so the other point I would want to make about the post-Reconstruction era is, is that it was the second instance in which there was an opportunity uh, for free blacks and, uh, and, and poor whites to unite, uh, but uh, any, any, such, any such promise of that was, was really uh, sabotaged by uh, the planters who uh, invoked uh, race as a wedge uh, between uh, any such, any such uh, uh, a union that might have occurred. So what did happen, as we know, was the rise of the Klan, and you know this. And this is a passage from uh, uh, you know, and uh, Lehman's book uh, uh, also kind of documents a great deal of the terror that surrounded the countryside as part of the attempt to uh, re-enslave uh, blacks, but. Uh, uh, as, uh, as the reading that I think some of you might have seen by uh, Kaufman Osborne points out, you know, lynching uh, you know, was, was in a way part of a system. It was a part of the system uh, uh, known as the underlaw uh, that included uh, other kind of uh, extra legal processes uh, which, uh, as he says, translated white custom into effective social control regardless of uh, the letter of the statute books. Uh, and so, again, I think I want to emphasize the role of uh, culture and ideology uh, 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 as, uh, that's, not, that's wrong, as, uh, there it is, sorry people, um, <laughs> way out of order, uh, as significant parts of the structure of, uh, uh, of law as it operates in our country. So, uh, again, I mentioned Plessy versus Ferguson earlier, uh, and, and, you know, which did kind of codify Dred Scott. 
and uh, uh, the difference being that it, it promised uh, a separate but equal, but it still enshrines this notion of, of, uh, uh, of keeping black and white apart. And uh, it's the legal pinning for Jim Crow, whose legacy still endures to this day. Um, and uh, you know, there, there's a, I mean, it's, it's incredible in kind of preparing for this to, to kind of look at the, the kind of images that we still have of that era, and uh, they're, 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 they're sobering indeed. Uh, so, so this, this battle of ideology uh, is one that, that's really, uh, uh, really critical to understand. Uh, this book by Nicholas Lehman, uh, you know, uh, called Redemption, The Last Battle of the Civil War, uh, really uh, spells it out and spells out in, 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 in equally painful detail to, uh, to Blackman's book. Uh, you know, it begins by recounting uh, uh, events in Colfax, Louisiana in 1893, where 70 black militiamen were killed by white vigilantes in a dispute over election results. Uh, federal troops were dispatched to the area, uh, but within three years, uh, the Supreme Court would rule in favor of states' rights in the face of federal authority. Uh, and here we see the law being used to protect terrorism. Uh, but the strength of the book is really in its historiography and the kind of story it tells about uh, this, how this battle for redemption took place uh, in, in other cultural manifestations, including this, uh, this play by uh, Thomas Dixon, The Klansman, a historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, which, well, despite its romantic storyline, depicts members of the Klan as saviors saviors of a race, saviors of a culture, protecting whites, especially white women, from the dangers posed by free blacks. You know, although some ridiculed it and some were outraged uh, in other parts of the country, uh, it was actually widely viewed and immensely popular in many parts of the country. Indeed, as most of you know, it became the basis of D.W. Griffith's famous and sadly timeless, timeless film, Birth of a Nation. I say sadly because I actually remember uh, as a freshman in a film class uh, walking into class and in one of the first classes uh, this film was shown and I was told that it was the first great film ever made uh, and, and I was, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was terribly distressed at, at what I saw and the notion that this was great art uh, which depicted, you know, blacks as monkeys and uh, 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 really uh, 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 dabbled in stereotypes that were, were quite painful. Uh, but uh, it was also, the, the film was also, uh, aside from being critically acclaimed, uh, instrumental in the resurgence of the Klan uh, in the early uh, 20th century. So Lehman also uh, points out uh, that, uh, that the, the, this, this theme of redemption, this retelling of history of, of uh, the, the South kind of overcoming its, its, uh, uh, its unfair treatment and, and this kind of idea of protecting uh, the, the sanctity of, of white uh, society and uh, was, had really kind of um, uh, subtle, subtle uh, but, but powerful uh, expressions. And he points to a chapter in JFK's uh, Profiles in Courage, uh, a chapter about uh, Lucius Lamar. Uh, Lamar had been, uh, uh, was, was both best known, I think, uh, in contempt by, by, by uh, modern uh, uh, Americans, uh, largely because of Kennedy, but, but as a man who eulogized uh, Senator Charles Sumner in 1874 and late in his life spent a lot of time uh, trying to see if he could reconcile uh, the, the forces in the South. But prior to that, in 1861, uh, Lamar was a staunch supporter of slavery and resigned his seat in Congress uh, and returned to Mississippi to draft the state's articles of uh, secession. He served as an ambassador in the Confederacy, uh, appointed by the Confederacy, uh, and he did go on to craft a much more moderate career, but his ascension uh, to the level of national hero suggests just how complete the revisionism of the Civil War had become. Uh, I think this represents quite a different kind of erasure uh, that uh, we don't uh, often recognize. 
Now, a colleague of mine, Donald, Donald Yakovon, <clears throat> has embarked on a study of, of how race has been treated in history books across the generations. Uh, this was originally designed to be a chapter in a much larger book about uh, the history of, of, uh, of slavery. Uh, but he, he was stunned by what he found. He's been, been through hundreds of textbooks, uh, and he discovered that very prominent historians uh, across the ages, but certainly in the 20th century, have been expressing these, these attitudes toward blacks and whites that were, were, were actually uh, kind of uh, under, underpinning stereotypes and, and uh, 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 ways of thinking both about blacks and whites. Uh, he, he found work by a, 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 a scholar named John Hicks, uh, who was really very well known and, and prominent and had written a very popular book called The Populist Revolt, in which he had said, uh, described slavery as, quote, by and large, a distinct advance over the lot that would have befallen him, the slave, had he remained in Africa. Now, this was a standard storyline. He went on to say, quote, cohabitation without marriage was regarded as perfectly normal and a certain amount of promiscuity was taken for granted. Slave women re rarely resisted the advances of white men as their numerous mulatto progeny abundantly attested. And then there's Woodrow Wilson himself, who wrote, in the heart of the South, domestic slaves were almost uniformly dealt with indulgently and even affectionately by their masters. Even field hands were comfortably quartered and kept from overwork both by their laziness, here we have it, and the slack discipline to which they were subjected. So Donald found that those attitudes weren't only in college textbooks or by prominent uh, politicians, but they were, they were in textbooks used in schools. We had these depictions uh, uh, that, 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 that were used to teach, uh, teach Americans the history of slavery and the history of uh, white dominance. Uh, this is from a, a book. This is from a book that's written by uh, a couple of folks, uh, Rhode Island, I think, Long Island uh, teachers themselves, uh, and uh, was uh, designed, I think, for seventh and eighth graders. And it used a picture from uh, 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 *Birth of a Nation* to kind of convey this question of the night riders as they worked at night, uh, which is I mean, it's just, it, it was just startling. Uh, he also found another 700-page textbook for young Americans, uh, which had a chapter called The Story of the White Man. So, you know, I'd suggest that both of these tendencies are alive today, that there's this kind of the former, you know, part of it has become white supremacy, the story of the Klan and redemption is white supremacy. And, and, and the depiction of, of blacks as lazy, slovenly, uh, kind of lucky to be here uh, is an enduring association between certain qualities of person and blackness. Uh, Indeed, although the science kind of documenting the operation of implicit bias has been uh, pretty clearly established, it, its, its origins are murkier, and I think that a great deal of it resides in this kind of literature. So I want to shift to the, the middle of uh, uh, the 19th century, and I think I, I think you all were able to look at a clip from this series, Race, the Power of an Illusion, which, again, I'm sure many of you know, is a very powerful PBS uh, three-part series that's a, a really a, a, a wonderful introduction to the issue of race in this country. Uh, and, uh, you know, I commend it to you for that reason. But as you know, uh, the, the piece that you looked at has to do with housing. And uh, it has to do specifically with the system of redlining uh, that determined uh, which neighborhoods would be uh, eligible for the new uh, mortgage products that were coming on the market uh, that allowed uh, many, many, many more people to purchase their homes. There are many striking things about this section of the series, but this image uh, on the side of a wall that was constructed to separate a, a black community which was ineligible from a white community which was eligible and which after the, after the wall went up, uh, uh, housing development went, went forward on the other side, is, is, is an incredibly stark picture of the reality of how uh, uh, 
the regulatory system in this country uh, served to uh, divide us by race. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting because when I talk about this, lots of people have heard about redlining, but many people echo uh, the comment of the, the wife of a World War II veteran who was interviewed uh, in, in the film who said, you know, who had, had gone to try to buy a house in Levittown and had been told uh, that, that, that the owner wasn't sure whether he was going to be selling to Negroes. And she said, and then for them to tell me because of this color of my skin, I can't be part of it. Man, she said, I can understand an individual depending on his environment, his family or whatever, but for your country to sanction it, give him the tools to do that, there's something definitely wrong. So, and although redlining has been outlawed uh, and few such wall, walls like this exist anymore, the fact is the damage has been done. The barriers remain seemingly impermeable. We have uh, a segregation that is in this country that seems it, it, impossible to overcome and uh, the legacy of redlining uh, and walls like this uh, lives on in the social construction of our society. <coughs> Oops, I just didn't realize I had that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> so this brings us back to Charles Hamilton Houston, uh, and uh, whose, whose determination to dismantle Jim Crow uh, defined his life. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Houston slowly chiseled away at the doctrine of separate but equal by proving that, that it, was a, it was a virtual impossibility to obtain. Uh, and he did so, as I said at the beginning, by introducing uh, social science as a critical tool of the law. And I'm sure most of you know about the work of uh, uh, Kenneth and Mamie Clark and, and the Dow test, um, uh, which uh, was, was, a, was a really uh, a critical piece of the Brown versus Board of Education argument and I think uh, had a great deal of, of sway over the decision uh, because, uh, as the Clarks themselves said, it, it proved that prejudice, discrimination, and segregation caused black children to develop a sense of inferiority and self-hatred. Uh, and I think uh, I would, uh, uh, re I would uh, return to this slide and say that it is one of the most uh, telling uh, uh, parts of this slide that that young girl is holding a white doll in this scene. So Brown versus Board of Education itself. Uh, here's a passage from, from Justice Warren, and, and I've, I've, I've emboldened the term citizenship because I think uh, what Justice Warren argued was that uh, this destruction of separate but equal uh, would, uh, uh, and, and, and education itself uh, is the foundation of good citizenship, he said. You know, and I think I would suggest, I would hope that maybe he had in mind something of the notion of citizenship that we have in mind, which means that it prepares people to be, it, 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 it welcomes people as members of society and prepares them to participate in ways that, that define uh, uh, our best interests. So uh, I'm going to make a shift and briefly talk about implicit bias. I had another slide in here that I can't find that included uh, some quotes from President Obama uh, who, who, who has spoken on about implicit bias and at one point I asked of all of us, are we doing everything we can to wring bias from our systems? Uh, but uh, I'll suffice it to say that I think that this question, suffice it to say that I think this notion of implicit bias has replaced uh, or taken the place of the Dow test in, in Kenneth and Mamie Clark's work and uh, has created a new challenge for the law as to how to use this burgeoning field uh, within the law. I think it's going to take some time to chip away, but uh, I think that work has begun. So I want to briefly talk about two other things if I have some time. Um, and, and, and this is uh, related in, uh, to the redlining and to raise the power of illusion, and it has to do uh, with where we are today in terms of uh, the wealth in our society. Uh, those of you from Boston might have seen a few weeks ago the release of this report uh, called The Color of Wealth uh, in Boston. And you might have been struck, as everyone was, by the Boston Globe headline that read, that was no typo. The median net worth of black Bostonians really is 
dollars. Now that in and of itself uh, is staggering, but what's more staggering is the rest of the article, which, the comp which is that the comparable figure uh, for whites is $247,500. Two hundred forty-seven thousand five hundred to eight, and it, it, it is really virtually it's, it's, it's inconceivable. And I think it reflects uh, the legacy of, uh, of of home ownership in large part because, as we know, most of our our value, most of our equity, most of our wealth is in housing, and uh, this reflects the fact that for 70, 80 years, whites have been able to accumulate wealth through housing, and blacks were set aback by by the uh, policies of the government. So uh, I'd like to close, uh, well, I'm sorry, this is a graphic depiction of the same uh, 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 data, basically, showing in, in graphic terms, uh, you know, I think the figure, the, 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 the numbers are more dramatic even than the figure, but, um, so I want to close with two things, uh, and Deb, I, you tell me if I have time here. You do have time, yep, okay. maybe five more okay. minutes. Okay, all right, great, great, great. Um, so, um, uh, two things. I, I began, uh, I mean, they're both related, they're related to my son, who I mentioned earlier, and this notion of erasure. Uh, and, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, my son uh, 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 was talking about a project he had at school, and he's, you know, he said he had to try to identify um, uh, 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 eight contributions uh, African Americans have made that, uh, to American society. Uh, in one artistic, either artistic or literary or, or social. And, and I said, well, that's an interesting project, you know, and I, and I said to him, uh, I asked him uh, if he knew anything about rice. I asked him if he knew anything, uh, had he ever heard of Uncle Ben's rice? And he said he hadn't, but uh, that his class had, in fact, talked about uh, the stereotype of Aunt Jemima, and uh, they had been quite troubled by it. And, I, and so I said, I told him the story. I said, you know, it's really interesting uh, that Uncle Ben, that picture of Uncle Ben and Uncle Ben's rice reflects an incredible historical fact. Uh, and that historical fact is, uh, is, is contained in this book by Judith Carney. Now, Carney is a botanist by training. Uh, she studies seeds and plants. And she was really interested in the dispersal, or the kind of exchange of plants and seeds across the Atlantic, back and forth. And so she started to do research on rice. And she found that the popular lore and understanding was that American rice cultivated in South Carolina uh, for, 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 over, for a couple of centuries came from Asia. And that's what we all thought. But her research demonstrated that, in fact, the rice came from Africa. It was, it was, it was uh, a strain of rice that was known from, that was uh, uh, grown on the coast of Africa. But then, then she went even deeper and she found that not only was the rice itself from Africa, but that the social organization of its growth and production uh, and the technology used to uh, create the uh, rice fields also came from Africa. And that in and of itself is an interesting finding. And you know, we, we learn about these things all the time. But she also found that what planters did, planters knew specific regions of the coast of Africa where rice was grown. And they basically ordered slaves from those regions. So we had, we had this system of, uh, uh, of importing uh, rice for very specific reasons, which again, you know, uh, well, I won't say too much more about today and, 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 and migration, but I, I think it demonstrates, uh, you know, the incredible power of erasure uh, that we face. And, uh, and uh, you know, my son went on to write his paper not about this because he's an independent fellow and didn't want to uh, and would, would be loath to, to write about something I told him, uh, but I think it, it, it sank in with him. Uh, uh, so before closing, I'll, I'll say, uh, uh, that uh, uh, just as Marcia mentioned uh, uh, the efforts at Georgetown, my alma mater, uh, you know, th there are other examples of, of that kind of uh, thing going on that I was going to talk about here, here, here at Harvard Law School, uh, but I won't. Uh, 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 
so many of you might know about the, the Harvard uh, Law School Shield, which uh, includes these images, which are drawn from uh, the royal family, which was a slave-owning family, uh, and uh, whose money was at the, at the heart of the founding of Harvard Law School. And so it's, a, it's something that we wrestle with here as well. Uh, but I, I will close by, uh, I think, I hope, teeing up what's to come next. and and uh, say that uh, several years ago we had th this event, uh, Checking Under the Hood, in which we had uh, Daryl Parks and Benjamin Crump, two attorneys uh, for Trayvon Martin's family and Sabrina Fulton, and uh, you know they joined us and talked about the legal strategy they were using to vindicate uh, uh, Trayvon Martin uh, and to seek justice for him. Uh, and uh, I will end with this uh, image, uh, which uh, suggests kind of the situation we're in now, I think, and my hopes that the Movement for Black Lives and others can help us move forward toward a justice that is inclusive. So uh, with that, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, turn it over to questions. Thank you, David. That was an incredibly illuminating portrait of all the different ways that the law has influence African American lives, but how also the law exists in a social context. And my mind is sort of buzzing with the ways that law has been an instrument of injustice in this country and how closely the legacies of the past have grafted on to our present realities in the place where we find ourselves. The role of education really stood out for me. Um, almost in an empowering way as an example of how much influence education has and how the images that we share with our students become part of their mental kind of framework for mm -hmm. constructing their ideas about race. Mm -hmm. So it's something we can all take very seriously, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, now is a great time to post questions into the chat box about any of the topics that Dr. Harris has mentioned. Um, there have been some as we've been going along, David, so I want to um, backtrack just a little sure. ways to pick mm -hmm. up some of the ones that we caught along the way and um, add them in. Lots of comments about um, <laughs> you know, the, the advantages that have accrued to whites from this oppression. Um, Julia asks, is there a comparison anywhere of that financial difference, not just the $8, but the heritage difference? I think she's referring to the Boston Globe article there. Right, meaning, meaning how much of that is inherited versus how much of it is kind of earned? Is, I'm, I'm wondering if that's, if that's what she means. Um, so or it, it may also be the different, um, you know, how they broke it down by uh, Caribbean and right, Dominican. Right, right. right. So, uh, you know, I, if I understand the question, so it's not clear, first of all, it's pretty dramatic all around, right? It's pretty, the, the, the difference is pretty dramatic for all groups, right? Uh, between whites and, and, and any other groups of color. Uh, what proportion of that, if the question is kind of, is there any sense of uh, which or how much of any of this is a result of, of inheritance, say, for Caribbean blacks or Puerto Ricans uh, versus uh, U.S. blacks? Um, I don't know of any research on that. I don't know if it's been disaggregated in that way. I think it probably would be pretty difficult to do. Uh, and again, you know, this th this was this was based on some survey results, and these are median numbers. So, I I don't know the answer to that. If I'm if I'm observing the question correctly, I don't really know uh, if it's been broken down in that way or if it can be. So, but do you think, Deb, I'm not g getting the question? I'm not sure if I am either. So, Julia, if okay. you want to just add in um, any clarification, we can take it up from there. In the meantime, yeah, yeah, Sandy G asked the cheeky question of, given the long-term injustices, would you liken the ability of black people to withstand the injustice to supernatural <laughs> or superhero, <laughs> well, perhaps, in our current moment? Uh, yeah, you know, it's an interesting, you know, that's a, <laughs> yeah, I'm reminded 
th there was a film here that was made here called The Angry Heart several years ago. And it, it was about a young, it wasn't so young anymore, maybe in his 40s, who, who had had a heart attack. And uh, it was a very dramatic thing. He had basically driven himself to the hospital, and, and he almost died. And this film went through a lot of the kind of issues that he faced, including uh, facing bias by the doctors and this, that, and the other. But there was a point in it when this man, this man who was a vegetarian and kind of thought he did, was do, living his life right and all that, he said, uh, uh, you know, uh, I used to think I was a, a rock. He said, you know, I, I rock on the shore and uh, that I could stand the pounding, that, I, that the, waves, the waves would hit me, but I stayed, I stood, he said, you know. And what I've come to realize uh, is that, that those waves were slowly chipping away at me, right? They were slowly taking pieces of me away. And it's a profound thing because... You know, there was at once a strength to withstand and a recognition of a toll that it took. Um, so, whether it's superhuman, I don't know. I mean, I, I personally, uh, you know, again, this is this is really kind of getting into some personal thought here. I, I think of uh, Black Americans in a way as the conscience of this country, right? Uh, and uh, that uh, if there is actually any hope for the future, and this was to me the promise of President Obama, despite some other things that, about, about his uh, administration, I'm not fine on this, um, th th this idea of elevating us uh, to, to a different or higher uh, uh, moral standard. And I do think that, you know, despite whatever the characters or stereotypes about black people are, I think it's true that, that black people are, in fact, capable uh, of incredible, incredible uh, compassion. And if there's any hope for this country, it's going to take that. I mean, you all, some of you read uh, uh, a piece of Brian Stevenson. You know, Brian Stevenson, uh, is as forthright as can be about what's wrong with this country, about the injustices, about the unfairness, about the oppressive nature of it. But he also starts to talk about mercy. He talks about, if you, he talks about uh, our, our need to be able to find mercy. And, uh, you know, again, I think this is a black man whose work has seen some of the darker sides of this country who still can talk about what we can be. Uh, so, is it superhuman? Uh, you know, my religious tradition is as a humanist, and I would say it's not superhuman, it's human. And that some of the things that we've been up against have been inhumane. So, uh, That's a great response, David. I want to just toss in a question about controlling the narrative, because it seems to me part of the systemic oppression has been the way in which from the Civil War onward, Southerners and, uh, you know, racial oppressors have controlled the storyline in a way that we, that many have tried to confront, but that still seems to have a grip on the nation as a whole. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about how we begin to get more of this messaging out there, because there's clearly a long way to go. Well, you know, that's, that's again, that's a tough one, but, uh, you know, I'll come back uh, to, to, to Brian Stevenson, uh, you know, who is, uh, has embarked on this project to uh, uh, create memorials at the sites of all the lynchings, right, and, mm. and, and have us kind of start to understand and see uh, 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 kind of how, how ubiquitous it has been. Um, I, I think the you know the stories. Uh, you know, I think the more we can, we again. I'm, I'm <laughs> I, I, basically with many others. I have to suspend a level of disbelief in terms of where we are right now, um, in terms of how hopeful one can be. But I will say that before the last election. Uh, there was a poll that was done that found that the number of white Americans who thought that there was still racial oppression 
and racial inequality in this country was going up, right, that more whites were starting to recognize that the civil rights struggle wasn't over, that oppression remained, that privilege remained, there was movement, right? Uh, and, and as I said earlier, I think there is this idea of evolving standards. I mean, it, 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 it might be very slow, and as we know, this, the, the Brown versus Board of Education decision used the phrase with all deliberate speed, which as we know means walking as slowly as you can, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it took a second decision to say, no, you have to do it, you have to do it uh, with a little bit more real speed. Uh, but, but it was progress, right? And, and I think the fact, it, it's, it, it's slow progress, but I do think that the, the hope is with people on this, uh, you know, on this webinar, right? That we can find ways, uh, some of this stuff is very difficult, and, and I, I don't envy, a, a teacher trying to navigate through some of this. It's really hard and I, and I wish that we could be having an exchange here so I could hear from you all what you think about how, you know, I mean, you, you can't just throw these images out, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, especially with young people. You have to be able to help them process. Uh, but I do think that, that, that education, uh, education understood as uh, recognizing and challenging dominant narratives, right? Not just regurgitating them, but showing them for what they are uh, is the hope. And you know, uh, and again, I say, you know, look, I, you know, I have a kid about to go off to college, and I have to, I have to hope uh, uh, that that he carries with him, uh, uh, you know, a, a different way of, of approaching these narratives and a different way of challenging them uh, and a different way of listening as well. So, I don't know. Thanks. That's great. Um, Heidi asks, we often hear here in Boston that our students are not seeing themselves represented in the teachers, which can affect how they learn and more. I agree. Do you have any suggestions on how we white teachers can help to make our children feel more represented that we may not have thought about? So that's a... <laughs> yeah, that's a tough yeah. one. <laughs> that's a tough one. You know, because as, as somebody who in, in 12 years of public school education to have one black male teacher, uh, you know, I, I uh, and, and he, and who I will say uh, was one of the few teachers who would not take any crap from me, right, so uh, he, he, was, he was great. Uh, I, I don't know how to answer that, um, I, I, and I'm not, I, I, I'm not, I don't want to be dismissive. Um, uh, and again, I, that's why I wish we were kind of in a group because I'm sure there are some others out there who have some ideas. Um, but uh, but I, I will say that I, I think um, I think you know res respect is critical. Young people uh, uh, kind of know, understand, and appreciate respect. Uh, but I think there's also an element. You know, I, I didn't talk about this so much, but you know, in this community justice work that we do, where our goal is to try to make sure that the voices of community are, are elevated. It's very difficult, right? It's difficult for somebody like me, right, who's the kind of professional, right, for, for my colleagues and friends who are advocates and, uh, and activists uh, to, to actually uh, live up to that, 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 that goal, right, and to uh, 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 kind of, in a way, check our privilege or our position or whatever and uh, and I think you know teachers have a, a different problem. You know you have to maintain order and there's some bit of hierarchy. But I think creating an atmosphere in which it, which voices are you know people feel that their voices are heard and respected and their experience is is valued. I think that's a step. Um, and 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 as with my colleagues, I mean there are setbacks, right? You know, <laughs> and uh, there are mistakes, but. Uh, but if you're committed to it, um, as, as I'm sure, you know, Heidi is, um, it was Heidi, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think it shows. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, 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 none of it is easy or immediate, but I think the commitment and uh, sincerity uh, do show. Thanks, David. 
Julia asks, in terms of reparations, how do we assess what advantages over time, you know, beyond just housing investments, but really passed down from generation to generation um, or that are based initially on slavery, how do you begin to quantify mm. something like that? Yeah, yeah, wow. So I don't know. Um, that, again, why are these people asking all these hard questions? Uh, uh, you know, because I, and I would, I would, I would extend that question and say that it's not just uh, up until the end of slavery that the last 160, 170 years uh, have been uh, a, a continuing. Uh, 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 that, that, that the bill has continued to grow, right? That that the, that that that, our, that that people of color, especially black people, have and communities especially have been underdeveloped, under-resourced in ways that have it, it, it have expanded the gap. And uh, um, so, but I, I will say that part, I, reparations is, is itself is a touchy subject. Not that I don't believe in it, but it's a very difficult one. Uh, one of the quotes that I had. Uh, uh, from Barack Obama, it was, uh, you know, at one, at one point he talks about it being very difficult to expect people uh, uh, who, who have privilege or resources to give that privilege or those resources up, right? Um, but, you know, one of the things I think we can do is find ways to add voices to the discussion about the expenditures we're making as a society today. Right. So I think there are corrections we can make. There are ways that we can talk about changing the, the patterns of expenditure from, shall we say, this incredibly overly punitive uh, uh, war on drugs and war on crime that has uh, affected uh, c communities of color, people of color, in much greater ways than anyone else, uh, that we can start to think about spending the same money we're spending on that in other ways. And, and that's a step toward repair, if not reparations. And I think uh, the, the key to that, and, you're gonna, and you'll hear this next time, right? <laughs> the key to that is, is increasing the number of voices of people, uh, not only complaining, but mobilizing, organizing, making demands, and running for office, all of those things. Um, and and uh, and and young people who uh, uh, kind of demand the repair, if not the reparations. You know, if the reparations aren't there, there still are things that we as a society can and must do uh, uh, to repair the damage we've been meeting out over the centuries. So I'm sorry, uh, Julia. That's not, um, you know, uh, I, that's not. How, I have no idea how to make the calculation. So I rambled on about something else. I like that you ended on a hopeful note there, though, because it gives a sense of how kids can find their way into this and how people can express their citizenship in order to help others gain full citizenship in a sense mm -hmm. of um, not just having a stake in the system, but being important voices within it. So can I make a plug? Can I make a plug go for, for it. my organization? Yes. So we started this project that we call Just Flix. And uh, it, what it's designed to do is to have high school students use their cell phones as they are wont to do uh, <laughs> to make films about uh, people in people and organizations in their communities who are doing justice work. Uh, and uh, you know we are looking to recruit students to do that, to post these on our website, and to kind of help facilitate uh, screenings of their films and. Um, you know, I think it, you know the idea behind it is that it's a way to get students out into their communities, un, you know, kind of understanding what's going on, exposed to to justice work, and uh, and introduce them to a level of participation and voice uh, that uses the instrument on which they live. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Can people contact you directly, David, if they want to know more sure. about that sure. project? Sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I think I don't. I guess you can give them my email or something, right? Uh, yeah. 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 So people yeah, can just yeah. contact me, and I'll put you in touch. Yep. Yeah. David, thanks so much. This has been fantastic. I 
I have a whole new reading list of books I want to <laughs> look into uh, and am inspired to learn more about. I think these issues go deeper into the past, but also deeper into the present reality mm -hmm. than I, for one, had realized. And mm -hmm. I think I speak for us all in saying thanks for introducing us to a kind of new dimensions of some of our existing social reality. It's been a huge help. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be with you on this day when we think about students and teachers especially tonight. So thank you thanks all. Thanks for that too. As you all know, you can stay in touch with Primary Source through lots of different mechanisms. You can find out about future webinars and we'll be be in touch with you about the next webinar and encourage anyone who is taking this series for PDPs to post your ideas about teaching applications or your reflections on this webinar or on the readings to the link that Stephanie will send you. We, we love the ones that you sent from the first webinar and we're looking forward to reading more. So thanks to all of you for joining us tonight and a big thanks again to David. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone.